Good evening. I apologise for not giving this talk in person, but I suffered a stroke a few days ago and wasn't able to make the trip. I started in the field of infrared spectroscopy in 1964 at Oxford University. I didn't think it was going to become my career, but things worked out in an interesting fashion and I'm glad that it did. During the time that I was at Oxford, I loved playing cricket and rugby because it took my mind off work for a few hours. There is no way you can think about far infrared spectroscopy when you're being tackled by a large opponent on the rugby field. Rugby was not very time consuming, but that's not the case for cricket. A cricket match usually starts at about 11 a.m. and finishes about 6.30 p.m. with breaks for lunch and tea. I would come into the lab in the morning of a, of a home game set up my experiment and start my instrument running for a six hour long scan. I would then pedal to the St John's College sports field and start to play the game. At tea time I would quickly pedal back to the lab and reset my instrument for another six hour scan. This only took a few minutes so I was not only able to return to finish the game, but also to replace those precious bodily fluids in the lamb and flag after the game was over. After closing time, I would go back to the lab and reset my instrument for another six hour scan. I therefore did about 20 hours work in addition to playing cricket for almost seven hours. After Oxford, I traveled to College Park to do my postdoc work. I had not arranged for any place to live and didn't know my way around the campus, so I left my two suitcases under a hedge and walked to the chemistry department to see who I could find to help. It was dinner time and only one of Ellis Lippincott's group was still working in the lab. That was John Leppard, and he was very helpful. We picked up my cases, had dinner and a few beers, and then went back to his apartment where I slept for three days until I found a place of my own. I chose to work on an interesting project that involved trying to simulate conditions on which biologically important molecules could be formed on planets similar to Jupiter or its moons. After my postdoc was over, I worked for a year for Digilab and two years for Sattler Research before accepting a position with Ohio University. I worked at Ohio University from 1972 to 1982, worked at the University of California Riverside from 1982 to 1989, and then finished my career at the University of Idaho, serving as chair of the department for a total of eight of those years. I retired in 2008 and now live in San Marcos, Texas. During all this time, I've been fortunate enough to attend many conferences Dominant among those has been the Pittsburgh Conference, which, which I've attended every year since 1968. Even though PitCon dominated the spring conferences, there were many meetings in the fall where spectroscopy also played an important role. These included the Eastern Analytical Symposium, the Society for Applied Spectroscopy National Meeting, Smaller meetings such as Anakem, Pacific Conference and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Meeting, as well as the major meeting like the ACS National Meeting. In 1973, a number of analytical organizations got together to confederate. The organizations who originally agreed to confederate and became founding members of FACTS included the following the American Chemical Society Division of Analytical Chemistry, ANACEM, the International Society of Automation Analysis Instrument Division, Eastern Analytical Symposium, American Microchemical Society, and Mid-America Conference, and of course the Society for Applied Spectroscopy. A number of groups joined the Confederation later. These included domestic organizations like the Koblenz Society in 1983, the American Electrophoresis Society in 2012, the North American Society for Laser-Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy, or LIBS, also in 2012, 
the Council for Near Infrared Spectroscopy in 2013, the International Society for Clinical Spectroscopy in 2017, and the Society for Archaeological Sciences in 2019. There were also several international societies, which included the Royal Society of Chemistry Analytical Division in 1989, the Spectroscopical Society of Japan in 2012, the Infrared and Raman Discussion Group also in 2012, and the Austrian Society for Analytical Chemistry in 2017. All these groups got together to form a powerful confederation known as the Federation of Analytical Chemistry and Spectroscopy Societies, FACS. The original goal of FACS was to hold an annual conference at which papers could be presented and information shared between colleagues. Many papers were longer than 20 minutes to allow for better and more detailed introductions. What this led to was a rather mixed group of papers. There were papers that were one hour, 35 minutes, 30 minutes, 25 minutes, and 20 minutes in length. The total number of talks was 200. In 1984, a record high of 428 oral papers were delivered. After that year, it became the norm to encourage sharing material on posters in lieu of oral presentations, which allowed for many more ideas to be shared in a much more streamlined fashion. Other goals were that exhibitors should pay a major role in financing and that registration fees should be low. How low is shown by the following slide, where you can see that regular registration was only 20 bucks and student registration was a mere five. This proved to be untenable and registration fees went up considerably in the coming years. For example, now with 2023 registration, the typical member's registration fee was around $800. And for non-members, it went up to about $900. Students were charged about $300. To summarize, the cost to attend have risen by more than eight times inflation. It was decided that the conference should be held in inexpensive cities across the USA. Showing in this slide are the cities where fax was held over the first 25 years. You'll see that it was held in Philadelphia for nine out of the first 25 years, seven in a row and for a while it was expected it might remain there, but the streak was broken and the conference has changed venue ever since. The first year of facts was different as I brought my first group of graduate students with me. To keep costs low, we stayed in one of the less affluent hotels. Less affluent is putting it mildly. I should say at this point that the casino hotels were in the process of being built and the older hotels were in a pretty poor state of repair. The hotel in which we stayed rented out for 20 bucks a night, and by sharing, we kept the costs at rock bottom. One may question why we go to scientific conferences. Some of the reasons to attend are obvious, to hear about innovations in our field, to let other scientists in our field know what we have been doing, to meet up with colleagues and friends socially and professionally, to discuss potential collaborative projects and to meet with instrument company representatives. However, in my opinion, there are two other important benefits, to give students the opportunity to prepare their work and present it on posters, and to introduce our students, technicians, and new hires to leaders in the field. Since I've been around for a while, let me just discuss a little of the history of one of these topics, namely infrared spectroscopy. In this field, there are two main categories, infrared spectroscopy, which we subcategorize to far infrared, mid infrared, and near infrared, along with Raman spectroscopy. I will focus on mid infrared and far infrared measurements. In far infrared spectroscopy in the early days, Grating spectrometers dominated. 
There were large instruments such as the Perkin Elmer 225 and portable instruments such as the Perkin Elmer Infracord. A few prism instruments were still being used such as the Perkin Elmer 21. The first slow scan FTIR spectrometer was put out by Research and Industrial Instruments Company who were ultimately taken over by Beckman. Another slow scanning interferometer was output by Grubb Parsons, also in the USA. There was an interesting character who worked for RIC for some time, then switched to Société Clauderg in France, who also came out with a far infrared instrument. Lo and behold, he switched to Polytech in Germany, and they came out with a far infrared instrument. Pure coincidence, I'm sure. The next slide shows an early interferometer for far infrared spectrometry developed by Alistair Gebbie's group. It had a very large beam splitter that was about 10 inches across. This was similar to the instrument that was commercialized by RISC. I was a graduate student at the time they installed the first prototype in Harold Thompson's lab. The prototype had all sorts of problems. The moving mirror was the standard piston and cylinder with an oil bearing and one little bit of grit would stop the motion for some time. The output of the detector, which was strictly the interference record rather than the interferogram, was put out on paper tape and its data per rate was about one hertz. So you'd hear ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk all day except when the mirror stuck, in which case you'd hear Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, chunk 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 and then you knew you had to start again. The next slide is a photograph of the three instruments in Tommy's lab around 1967. A Grubb Parsons Mark II FTF far infrared spectrometer, a, an RIC FS520 far infrared spectrometer, and a homemade far infrared grating spectrometer that Tommy had made previously. All the time I was in his lab, this instrument managed to acquire one spectrum, while the two Fourier transform spectrometers produced several spectra per day. It was still difficult to persuade Tommy that an instrument that worked without a grating or a prism could actually produce a spectrum. The Grubb Parsons instrument operated at 0.2 reciprocal centimeters. I was actually measuring a heated gas cell here. The drive was just a standard micrometer drive. Not so easily seen is the RISC FS520 and this whole vacuum chamber only contained the interferometer. The first rapid scanning FTIR spectrometer of the modern era was introduced in 1969. Over the next 50 years, these instruments were improved and simplified to the point where thousands of them have been brought to market. It was not until terahertz time domain spectrometers were introduced around 2018 that major changes were made to these instruments. Much like far infrared spectroscopy in the early days, in mid infrared spectroscopy, grating spectrometers dominated and some prism spectrometers were still used. The first FTIR spectrometer that hit the market was the Digilab FTS-14, closely followed by the Nicolet 7199 and a plethora of subsequent instruments. Sampling techniques included capillary films and solutions for liquids, KBR discs and mineral oil molds for solids, and attenuated total reflection was just starting to be used routinely. As I noted before, the first rapid scanning instrument was the Block Engineering 196 interferometer used in the 1960s. This is a forebear of today's instruments. It was a small, portable, low resolution rapid scanning instrument. Its beam sitter was about a centimeter across, and its drive was a standard voice coil drive, analogous to what is used today. The beam was modulated without a chopper or without phase modulation. It incorporated a rapidly scanning mirror that modulated the beam. This was a concept that was developed by a remarkable man called Larry Mertz, who worked for Block Engineering. 
In September of 1969, the Digilab FTS-14, which was the first spectrometer of the modern era, i.e. one incorporated a TGS detector, a helium neon laser, and with mini computer control and data acquisition, was shown at the Ohio State Conference on Molecular Spectroscopy. This instrument heralded the second childhood of infrared spectroscopy and can be said to represent the second age of FTIR, not IR, spectroscopy. The first modern spectrometer was made by Digilab, which was a subsidiary of block engineering. It had occupied much of a decent-sized lab. On the left side of the picture is, is the cabinet that housed the optics, and on the right is the cabinet that housed the electronics. The performance of the early FTS-14 was not great relative to today's instrument. Know that it took 30 minutes to acquire and compute a spectrum at half-wave number resolution with acceptable signal-to-noise ratio. There was still an argument as to whether it was better to measure a spectrum at four reciprocal centimeter resolution on a grating instrument or an FTIR spectrometer. It took a further 10 years before that question was largely resolved in favor of the FTIR. Today, interferometers have become smaller and more rugged. The low susceptibility to vibration is due to both the improved optical design and mechanical design. Even the largest FTR spectrometers now occupy less than a square foot of bench space. The next slide shows a block diagram of the Digilab FTS-14 data system from the 1970s. The electronics were very different from today's instrument and consisted of several components including the mirror drive, a digital plotter and a teletypewriter. The most critical component was a 256 kilobyte disk. Compare this to today's terabyte drives. The following single scan spectrum from around 1972 shows the transmitting spectrum of a polystyrene film. Although much of the spectrum has a reasonably low noise level, the extreme ends can be seen to be very noisy. Today, beam splitters are fabricated with multiple layers, which has increased their range considerably. In practice, the signal-to-noise of today's spectrometers is more than an order of magnitude better than that of the first instruments. Some of the early instruments were quite complex. For example, here is a spectrometer from 1973. It consists of a dual source, a beam condenser, and an external beam. The only problem with this design is that you could only use one source at a time and the others had to wait their turn. Most of the instruments were much simpler. In the next design, the beam is first collimated and passed into a spectrometer and then focused in the middle of the sample compartment and finally refocused onto the detector. This design was much more efficient than the more complex design shown in the previous slide. Most instruments today are based on this design. As the years advanced, instruments got smaller and smaller. Shown in this slide is a Smith Detection Identify IR Portable FTIR Spectrometer, which was created in about 1990. In 2008, Thermo Fisher announced the release of the True Defender FT version 1.3 it could measure 650 to 4,000 reciprocal centimeters at better than four reciprocal centimeter resolution. It had single reflection diamond ATR for press and shoot capability and included a zinc selenide beam splitter and it worked in temperatures down to minus 20 Celsius up to plus 40 Celsius. Because the trend of most lab instruments is one of decreasing size and portability, it is not surprising that handheld instruments are now commonplace. It is logical at this time, therefore, to consider how small interferometers can be made. This slide shows a MEMS FTIR spectrometer from around 2013, which shows the world's first single chip FTIR spectrometer. This is an amazingly small instrument, measuring no more than 500 microns in any dimension. There were two versions, near-infrared and mid-infrared. 
The mid infrared version is photon stars and only transmits out to 5 microns. We have probably reached the limit for standard infrared spectroscopy. Nevertheless, once a template has been designed, hundreds of instruments can be fabricated from a single disk. There are many different instrument designs, too many to describe in a single, single talk. Let me just describe a few to show the progression. The simplest optics show a 6x beam condenser for center focus spectrometers, but this was even before my time. Microscopes were first built for FDIR spectrometers in the 1990s. When the first microscope was designed, only three of them were built. The designers thinking that that would be enough. They ended up by building hundreds. Over a third of the instruments that were built were built with microscopes. All these instruments were diffraction limited or worse. They included the Brooker Hyperion microscope showed here. One could not achieve better optical resolution than this without a radical change. The situation changed dramatically when Anasys Instruments introduced an AFMIR product in early 2010 that used a tabletop laser source based on a nanosecond optical parametric oscillator. The OPO source enabled nanoscale infrared spectroscopy over a tuning range of roughly 1,000 to 4,000 reciprocal centimeters or 2.5 to 10 microns. In the first design, the beam was brought from the back of the sample and was reflected internally as shown in this slide. In the later design, the beam was focused onto the sample from the top. Either way, the beam was no longer diffraction limited. Its size was governed by the width of the cantilever. Atomic force spectroscopy coupled with infrared spectroscopy is one of a family of techniques that derive from the combination of two parent instrumental techniques, infrared spectroscopy and scanning probe microscopy. The first instrument based on very sharp probes was a free electron laser combined with an atomic force spectrometer. The term was first used to denote a method that combined a tunable free electron laser with an atomic force microscope equipped with a sharp probe that measured the local absorption of infrared light by a sample. It required that the sample be coupled to an infrared transparent prism and be less than one micron thick. It improved the spatial resolution of photothermal AFM based techniques from microns to about 100 nanometers. Recording the amount of infrared absorption as a function of wavelength or wave number creates an infrared absorption spectrum that can be used to chemically characterize and even identify unknown materials. Recording the infrared absorption as a function of position can be used to create chemical composition maps that show the spatial distribution of different chemical components. In this talk, I have tried to show the evolution of the instrumentation for mid-infrared and far infrared spectrometry. I have been greatly assisted by my daughter Megan and by Ian Lewis. Clearly I have omitted many important developments in instrument development and have completely omitted applications and software. I'm sure there are many people in the audience who are in the process of truly innovative developments in far, mid infrared and far infrared spectrometry. I, for one, am truly excited to see how this field continues to grow and change in the next 50 years. Facts now call SIEX has been a huge part of my career and I've been very grateful to participate in it for so many years.